Welcome to the Business Trendsetter Podcast, where we talk about trends and how to use them to grow your business. My name is Manny Turan. And I'm Adam Hartung. We're Spark Partners. We're here every week to discuss all things trends. We look at things happening in the news. And of course, tech is one of those big movers, prime movers uh, that we uh, look at because, of course, uh, tech usually follows trends or is at least part of that landscape. And today's topic, we're going to talk about uh, Intel Inside. Intel, of course, once the dominant giant in the semiconductor space, um, most of my computers have had Intel chips in them. And so over the last couple of years, they have been missing some marks. They got some new leadership in place uh, and uh, have really been on the ropes. They've got a lot of money from the, from the government uh, for the CHIPS Act. And um, of course, they had the big layoffs a couple of weeks ago. And so we want to revisit that conversation because we think that because of Intel's size and scope historically, that it, it's worth talking about sort of where they are and where they might be going and some other interesting things about Intel. So I'll start there, Adam, if you want to go and uh, give, us our th- give us your thoughts. Yeah, well, when I give my presentations and I work with people, a lot of times uh, they, they accuse me of giving them a history lesson. And I'm sort of like, well, th- the reason I do this is because a lot of times the, the most recent thing that happened was actually set in motion many years earlier. And the, the earlier decisions drive forward. And the reporting right now is just about what's happening today without taking that backward lens that are going all the way back you know, and seeing where we came from. Um, and like, for example, you know, how could Kodak, I'm sorry, how could, um, yeah, Kodak develop instant photography and then completely, you know, the company go bust, you know, when instant photography is a big thing now, right? It's the, it's you mean, you know, the digital photography. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, how, how do companies make that, that have lots of resources? You know, IBM is, a, you know, invented the computer business and now trying to name one product that they sell, right? And so it's, it, you're like, how can you be so successful? And you're right. Intel was a very, very successful company. As you said, for many, many years, uh, you know, Intel Inside was a, a very important part of branding of any kind of personal computer. It didn't matter if it was made by IBM or Lenovo or, or Hewlett Packard or Compaq. You know, it was, it had Intel inside and that was considered a big deal. It was the microprocessor that was inside. And so now what we're hearing, seeing is the company's in deep financial trouble. It's trading the value of the company. You have to go all the way back to 2009 to try to find a time when it was of such little value as it is today. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's like from its peak, it's off 75% of its value. Uh, kind of like General Electric. Remember 20, it was 20 yep. years of General Electric, you know, going into the pooper, uh, during the Jeffrey Immelt era. And it's kind of like everybody focused on the last three or four years of Immelt, but actually decisions that he made early in, in his tenure had everything to do with what went wrong at the end. And so, Intel was a company that in one of my favorite books, The Innovator's Dilemma, um, Clayton Christensen talked about how successfully Intel used innovation. And and, and it turns out that that makes a big deal because in the 1960s was when Intel was started. And for those people that aren't familiar like you are, man, you you know everything about wafer manufacturing and chip manufacturing. But when they got started, they were basically taking wafers and they were making trans, putting transistors on wafers, right? Which was the a big thing. And they were very successful at that in the 1960s. And that was mostly a memory chip business. You know, people that we're figuring out how to use circuit design. We create a circuit board, put it into some kind of a specific purpose application, like say a guided missile, but then to drive it, you had to have memory. And so the mass chips were these, these, um, uh, memory chips and Intel was in that, but it was a very cutthroat, bloody, um, uh, low margin business. And that was in the 1960s. In the 1974, the, they had an idea and that idea was uh, uh, to, try to come up with a microprocessor. So that instead of designing every machine would have its own design, you would have a central chip, which we now known as a microprocessor. They had that idea in 1974. And so they had this thing called an 8008. They modified that to become an 8080. And in 1972, they really started working on it. 74, they were moving forward to bring it to market. And it had a couple of design flaws. So then they came out with the 8080A and the 8080A fixed that. So the reason I go back, that's when I started. My first company was we mm. used the 8080A microprocessor to do a front end system for Phototypesetter in 1977. 
And so that was, you know, I was very familiar with this, this, cause that's where my electrical engineering degree started, or my um, career started. That, of course, eventually, shortly after that, got turned into the 8086, which became the X86, which became the 286, 386, 486, right. all the way up to the PCs that we have today, right? Yep. Driving this, this standard. So you have a central processing unit, CPU in the computer. Our PCs, our Macintoshes, they all have this CPU in them. And Intel was, of course, the dominant company in that. Because what the x86 did was it made source code compatibility. If it ran on an 86 chip, then it would run on any 86 chip. So it could be, you know, like I said, Lenovo, or it could be Compaq. It didn't matter. So that conversion from memory to semiconductors was lauded in the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and explained how they innovated their way out of memory chips and into CPUs, and how the semiconductors then launched them off to be a great, great company. But what that did was it also locked in place a way of thinking about the company, which was around these CPUs, that effectively what they said was the CPU architecture would never change. And if you look, when the Macintosh started, a lot of people forgot this or never knew it, but when the Mac was invented, it didn't use the x86 microprocessor series. They used something called the 68000 that Motorola made right there in Phoenix. And so yep. that was the only really strong competitive CPU was the 68000. And they used that on the Mac because it allowed them to do uh, what you see is what you get screens. You know, like, for example, the font, you'd, if you had a PC back in the day when Mac came out, and you would say, well, okay, you would type in the text, but it all looked the same. And if you said, when it prints, I want it to print in Gregorian text, or I want it to print in whatever font, whatever font you like, you didn't yep. see it on the screen. You just told it what you wanted, and it would print it. Okay, you couldn't see it on the screen. Well, the 68,000 was a big part of what Mac let you be able to see the font right there on the screen. You knew what it was going to look like. You knew what the page was going to look like. You didn't just have text with paragraph breaks and little symbols. You actually could see it. And for years, the Macintosh was on the 68,000 microprocessor. It wasn't until um, many years later when they, Intel got the x86 so fast that, micro, that, that Apple said, hey, we could go ahead and run our code. We could port it over and run it on an x86 because now it'll actually support the functionality we want. But then they right. gave up on Intel in the year 2020. Design their own chips. So if you have a Mac today, it doesn't right. have a, of course, Motorola doesn't even have a chip business anymore. It has it for a long, long time. The Intel chip is no longer in the Macintosh. It's now the Apple a, a chip its own. So what we see here is a company that are very much into this one thing, the 8080, 8086, x86, and that's where they made money for a really long time. And then the second part of their business was foundries, which is the, the diehard business of taking wafers and putting transistors on them. You know, there's this thing called Moore's Law that everybody's heard of and basically said that the number of transistors would double, the number of transistors in a, in a space would double every two years and the cost would go down by half. And that was Jeff, uh, the guy, CEO Gordon Moore of Intel came up with that. Remember, that's transistors. Nobody talks transistors anymore. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's 1950s, 1960s technology, right? But this idea of taking a wafer and jamming this onto the wafer is where they started. And so they have the foundry business and the foundry business is making chips for other people. So for example, Broadcom uses the, uh, the, the, the wafers that are made by uh, Intel. And so Intel had this big bet in the CPUs and it made a big bet in the foundries, right? And it's trying to develop the foundry business as six foundries that they're trying to get set up today, three in the US and three in uh, offshore, All right? So, what we have is actually a company that's been locked in to the same business model since the 19th, early, at least since, certainly since 1980. So 40 yeah. years now, they've been doing the same thing, more, better, faster, cheaper, more, better, faster, cheaper. And when we were customers, we used to ask, well, how fast is the microprocessor? And we'd talk about millions of instructions per second or MIPS, right? Well, Along comes gaming. <laughs> and in gaming, you're not trying to do the kinds of things we do on a computer. You're mostly mm -hmm. doing a lot of graphics. And it turns out graphics, you don't need the instructions that are in a standardized uh, central processing unit. In fact, CPUs are very, very not very good. It, it's kind of like our brain. If you think about it, we can look at a bird and know it's a bird instantly. Tell a bird from an airplane just instantly, right? But for years, it was very hard to get a computer to make that distinction because it almost had to be an exact bird or an exact airplane to tell right. because everything's very specific but based on all these instructions. 
There's this thing that we came up with called floating point operations or flops. And flops were a way to get around working in graphics where you could actually move towards this idea of getting much more recognition and you could speed up the video. So we started operating on this notion of how many mega flops could I get or how many millions of floating point operations could I get per second, right? And that's yeah. when we started to see that develop. And that developed in the gaming world. And it was very, very successful for everybody that was doing gaming. So what's happening is the world's starting to spread apart. You got gaming going one way with mega flops and, and the kinds of, C, uh, of processing units they have. And you have Intel taking the PC industry in another way. And then what happens is AI comes along. And so NVIDIA is sitting out there and NVIDIA is saying, hey, we're really developing chips for graphics, but we now see that these could be applied in artificial intelligence. Because one of the things you can do with the, those sort of megaflop chips, you can run them in parallel. And so you could do parallel operations, which is how our brain works. The brain works right. very much in parallel. So that, that's why they call it artificial intelligence, right? In 2017, OpenAI, the biggest player in artificial intelligence, hooked, uh, went to Intel and they said, look, we need chips. We need a lot more chips, a lot, 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 lot more chips. Why don't you buy 15% of our company? We'll hook up together. And then your uh, unit that makes chips, well, you know, what they call the, um, their, their um, uh, data center unit, they could sell us the chips. You know, of course, we'd like to get a discount because we're a sister company. And at the time, what happened was Intel turned it down. So here we are in 2024, looking back saying, wow. That was one of those mm -hmm. decisions to turn that down in 17, like these other companies we talk about, you know, where they yep. make the decisions to do things that don't follow the market trend, that don't go somewhere new. And one of the things yeah. we now know is the engineers that were in Intel called the, these uh, floating point operation chips, the, these chips that operate uh, differently, these GPUs, they called them ugly. They didn't like the way they yeah. operated. They didn't like the way the circuitry worked in it. And they didn't really think it was going to be much application for it. And they said, you know what? CPUs will win in AI. We're convinced right. of it. Because we, look how we beat Motorola. Look how we ended up beating Sun Microsystems. Look how we've beat everybody by just getting our CPUs to be better and better and faster and faster and faster. We're going to, we, we predict that the CPU will go ahead. Yeah. And so I mean, that if you think was about the fatal decision. They didn't invest then, and they kept investing in the CPU technology. Now they're in a situation. So 2020 comes along. People start working from home. PC sales jump up. You know, shocks the heck out of everyone. And Intel, because it wants to believe, says, oh, the PC business isn't dead. Then starts gearing up to make many, many, many more PCs, which, of course, we know that was a spike, and it, and it fell back off, and the people aren't buying the PCs anymore. Yeah. So Intel wanted to believe in its past, and believing in its past, that's how it made the decisions that it made. And so it walked away from the AI business. Now what's happened is they're way off in microprocessors. <laughs> they don't have, you know, the, the processors. So, so, for example, the NVIDIA processor runs what they call exaflops. So it can run 200 exaflops. That means it does 200 quintillion operations per second. Now, these are instructions. They're operations. So it's an entirely different right. way of going about doing computing. And that's where the, the AI market is now. So when Intel drops out, Balmer has left Microsoft. The new CEO, um, Gelsinger. Brain. Yes. So he says, oh, I'll jump in there. And he takes that action. And of course, now Microsoft's doing incredibly well. But I think it's important to realize that the Bob Swan, who was the CEO, it's kind of like, you know, the guy who was running Netflix. I'm sorry, the guy who was running Blockbuster. And in, in 2000, Blockbuster was winning. You know, time goes for 2010, they're winning. Yeah. And then, you know, you start looking around and here's coming um, uh, Netflix, right? And Netflix is doing the at-home, sending the DVDs to the home. And, and Netflix goes to Blockbuster and says, look, you know, we're growing 40% per year. We have to keep raising cash. You know, why don't you buy us? And they go to the yep. CEO, Wayne Huizenga. And Wayne Huizenga had created waste management. He'd fought back the mob and he'd created waste management. It was a great company. He'd gotten into car sales. He had a bunch of dealerships. That was very successful. And he'd built Blockbuster, third really, really successful company. And he says, no, I don't think I want to do that. I don't want to buy your company because my earnings would get diluted. And, you know, really, 
it's a small business. I mean, your business is about 20% the size of our retail stores. So I just don't think I want to do it. And then 2014, it turned it down. In 2015, he turned it down again. And of course, we know that it wasn't long after that, about 2018, that there was no more Blockbuster, right? It was gone. It was out of business. And that, so the fatal decision was saying, hey, look, even though I've got a good business with Blockbuster, you had to realize it wasn't growing. In fact, it was shrinking. The number of stores were getting smaller. On the other hand, over here's this little guy. But he's grown really, really fast. And then you look at it now, you say, geez, you should have invested in that thing, right? That was growing. That's what we can see happen now to Intel. The thing that was growing fast in terms of hardware sales was gaming, right? And the performance of gaming machines was just really moving mm -hmm. ahead very, 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 very fast. And they, and, but Intel didn't, make, didn't see the trend. And if yeah. they did, they chose to ignore it. And then they do another thing that we often do in business, which is when we see something new that's different, we call it ugly. And we say, oh, the quality of that's bad. It's ugly. It's not an elegant design. It's a very new market. That thing's nowhere near as sophisticated as my thing. And so consequently, I want to keep my thing. I want to keep yeah, doing this. This is doing. a classic example of, of uh, you, what you described. We talk about all the time, which is the, uh, the defend and extend mentality, right? You're, you've got this installed base. You've got these foundries. You have this way of thinking. And for a company like Intel 10 years ago or eight years ago to make that shift away from their quote unquote core business into something new would have really been a, a cut across the grain of what they do. And I think that's a telltale sign. You know, we mentioned Blockbuster, Toys R Us, Sears, Kodak. I mean, the, the cemeteries are lined with these companies that made these decisions. <laughs> um, you know, the spike in computer sales, of course, uh, and if you look at the growth of AI, the growth of the computer business, and the growth of phones, and they're all very different growth paths, right? I mean, uh, I would imagine, I don't have the specific numbers, but AI and, and, uh, and mobile phones are 10 times the growth rate as, as PCs. And, uh, you know, why, why wouldn't you do that, uh, double down on, on where the trends are, why instead go back to what you're familiar with, what's quote unquote elegant, but of course the market shifts and here we are. Yeah, I mean, take a look again at, at what's happening at Intel happened in Microsoft. And I wrote m many columns about this for Forbes. I've talked about it in many presentations that Balmer was running Microsoft. And while he's running Microsoft, he bought an ERP company. He bought Skype, right? He bought, uh, he, he, they had the number one web browser out there with Internet Explorer. Um, there was all kinds of things going on in Microsoft that were really cutting edge. But what Balmer just kept saying, Windows and Office, that's the core of the business, yep. Windows, Office, Windows, Office. And he really kept putting the money and the company's energy into Windows and Office. Well, uh, when that business turned down, then what happened was Microsoft did badly. And, you know, I wrote a, my famous most the pro most profitable column I ever did was, you know, that, that Bomber was the worst CEO in America and he got fired for it. Right. And then what happened is Nardella comes in and what he says is I'm not pouring all my money into windows and office anymore. That's not a growth business. The growth business is software as a service and cloud computing. And he starts putting all Microsoft's money in that. And he puts money in open G uh, open AI. He gets into the AI game very early. This is exactly what the innovators dilemma has always been about. If you get stuck in the rut, of what you've always done, then you don't want to make the decision to change your resource allocation and go off in the new direction. Like Wayne Huizenga, you keep trying to keep the stores alive. Like if you look now what's happening to Walmart, Walmart bought Jet so it could be an electronic commerce business, but hey, they don't have much of an electronic commerce business. No, not Why? At all. Well, because they don't, they can't let go of the stores, right? And so they're not really a, a big threat. They're not a threat at all to Amazon, and they're not really doing much to help out Walmart. And so you keep saying, you know, Walmart's just going to keep shrinking and, and having its struggles. And that's what we saw happen then in Intel. So after Intel, after Microsoft makes the investment, things start going forward. It turns out that in 2016, they put 200, they put, I'm sorry, $400 million into buying a company called Nirvana, N-E-R-V-A-N-A. -E -E and what they said was, we're going to take those gaming chips and we're going to pull out the graphics of the gaming chips. So they'll be super, super fast at these parallel operations. And we're going to create these chips. And they sold some to Meta and, and they did have a marketplace. They did sell them. But by 2020, they just gave up and they walked away. 
right? And this is what we see happen over and again in big companies that are really wedded to something is the startup part, the thing that they say, well, okay, we're going to do that. They don't keep with it. They don't really try to make it grow. And the, the people that run the company keep very much their attention on the old part of the business. Um, you know, the, the mothership, I think is a phrase I've heard used, Manny, you know, the mothership, taking care of the mothership. And they don't really realize that, you know, the mothership, that's a meaningless term. I mean, right, that you've got a business that's not growing. You've got a business that's going to have its struggles. You're going to probably need to have a graceful exit from that business. What are you going to do? You've got to start investing in things that are going to grow. And so here, Intel not only didn't invest in open AI, but they shut down the AI chip business that they had. Again, going back to saying the graphic processing units and, and, and op measuring on flops instead of MIPS and those sorts of things was not the future. The past will continue to ride out into the future and we'll stay stuck where we are. And so just like Balmer screwing up, buying Skype, but then, you know, we zoom our way through the pandemic. We don't Skype mm -hmm. our way through the pandemic. You know, he makes these investments in things, but they, you know, they just never puts the money behind it to make it real. And the organization starts staying very committed to what it's always done. Yeah. And that's where Intel is now. It's stuck. It's trying to get these six wafer plants up and running. Well, it turns out that their new technology to try to stay competitive isn't coming along so good. Broadcom just came out and said, hey, we're not getting the number of chips off these wafers that we want. We don't have the number of good, uh, tr uh, uh, good um, measurable executions on these chips that we want. So the process that you're using... I think it's called the A18 or the 18A process that, that's supposed to be the newest Intel process. There's a lot of questions right now. And people that are looking to buy chips like Apple, like Meta, like Amazon are sitting back like, oh, so you're putting all these billions into these six plants. But now we don't know if they're committed to those contracts. So you not only have you've missed AI in terms of the central processing units are going away. They're being replaced with these uh, these these general processing units that are doing operating differently. And the foundry business is going to your competitor. Right. You yeah. stayed stuck in this foundry business that you probably should have gotten out of years ago. You should have realized that that's that's a grungy part of the business that you're not going to make much money. And you should have let other people go down that road. You kept trying to invest in it for only reason is that it's historical. And then you kept trying to protect your earnings, you know, by not investing in Nirvana, by not investing in open AI, by not producing chips for NVIDIA at very low price, right. you know, maybe that, losing that a little concept. money to get the NVIDIA business, you end up not getting, you get yourself stuck in a place where now today they're looking at splitting the company up. Yeah, that concept of protecting your earnings, although it, it does sound from the outside looking in, if you're a layman, you're thinking, oh, well, of course, they need to protect their earnings. They need to protect the, the shareholders. But the real question is at what cost? Because it's like taking that goose and cutting its head off so you can eat it today, <laughs> but not having the, the eggs for the, you know, the future. It's just ridiculous. And, you know, I'm a big I'm a big fan of of Intel overall of, uh, you know, in my previous company that you know, I had years ago, they were one of our clients and I made sure that all of our computers were Intel. And, you know, I, I still have a relationship with Intel and I, and I want them to succeed. But looking at these decisions they've made it's becoming very clear that the company that they wanted to become is not going to be the same as what they are going to become. And, you know, I think that a lot of, uh, of our listeners are small, medium sized businesses and they may think, well, this is, how does this affect me? I mean, it's just Intel, right? Who cares? It's not affecting my business, but the real question is it does. It's all kind of tied together. Uh, your ability to buy, uh, you know, your own computers, your ability to use AI is going to be affected. Uh, of course, the, uh, the the stock market, and I, want, I know you have some thoughts on that. Uh, it's all affected and it's all interrelated. Yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the things I drill home with companies is you have to grow your revenue at a minimum of 10% per year or you're falling behind because you have to keep up with the growth of the economy. You have to keep up with inflation. You have to have enough growth to cover the cost to replace your computers and desks and hire new people and all the things you have to do in your business. We start looking at all the things that you do, and then you want to have a little profit at the end of the day. To get there, you have to grow your revenue at 10% per year. And that means you pretty much got to double your business about every five and a half years. Yet I'll frequently ask somebody, what's your plan to double your revenues in five and a half years? And they have no clue. They're so, I'm busy running my business. And it, it, it's sort of like unless the market itself magically takes off and starts growing, then I don't have any plan to grow. 
And the reality is, is that means you have a plan to fail. Because if you're not keeping the revenues up, and so if we look, you know, for example, companies like Meta, when they put all of its, started to move all of its resources into the goggles and the headsets, and 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 Zuckerberg was saying that's the wave of the future, but there was no killer app. And nobody, not nobody, the market wasn't growing that fast. And then he wasn't paying attention to ad sales. The market shifted a little more towards Google and some other players. Then his revenue started to trail off and the stock just sunk like crazy. Then he woke up and said, okay, I, I get it now. And whacked the cost or how much he was spending on the meta project and started putting AI into the ad placement business. And then meta does really well again. Right. It's really keeping your eyes on the revenues. And it's keeping your eye out there saying, what do I have to do to keep my revenues growing? If if you protect your earnings, you'll be dead because you can't save your way to prosperity. I mean, you have to keep the only mm-hmm. way earnings keep growing is if sales keeps growing. You can't, your earnings are a result. If you don't keep growing right. sales, how do you think your earnings are going to continue to grow? And so Wayne Izenga should have immediately said, oh, these retail stores I have are doing fine. I probably could grow a few more of those. It's questionable. But man, this guy's with the direct to home thing. They got something going there. We should get after that. And that's really where our attention should be. Even if it's only 10, 15% of the size of the business I have now, it's still worth going after that next thing. And uh, again, that's where Microsoft is doing now. It's sh- shifted its resource development. And that's where I'm trying to make sure that our, all our small and mid-sized leaders out there, it's so easy to get caught up running the business. And you're running the business day after day after day after day after day. And you're not sitting there really realizing that, hey, you can get stuck in that rut and it's hard to get out. Right. And the whole culture mm-hmm. can start to get around protecting that business. And then people give up and they start saying, well, uh, OK, if revenues didn't grow, that's all right, because earnings are doing fine. Oh, man, that's that's yeah. the death knell. The, the analogy I like to use with, you know, sometimes I get into little mini arguments with uh, small to business or medium size, even some large business owners and executives with that same thing. Hey, I'm too busy running my business. Hey, I can't I can't. Uh, use any other time because I'm focused 100% on the business. And I say that you're, I say to them, well, do you maintain your car? Do you get the oil change? Do you add new tires? Do you rotate the tires? Do you do these, these service things? Because you, you know that that vehicle is going to need that. And if and they say, well, of course I do. Well, wh- why wouldn't you do, do that with your business? Why wouldn't you look at other opportunities? And that's one thing that, you know, at Spark Partners, we talk about a lot is the idea of creating a, a blank space team or a white space team that'll look at these opportunities. And of course, we talk about the five M's and one of those M's is the moat that you use to protect the business. And whether it was Nirvana, whether it was, you know, some of these things that, with other companies that have looked at, we talked about, you got to protect that, that little seed of a business because if Intel would have just doubled down on that Nirvana thing, or if they would have really taken a, a hard line look in, we'll say 2015 at their business, we wouldn't be talking right now. We'd be talking about some other um, company that uh, is, is failing. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, whether they did the open AI or not, they should have, as you said, should have realized, hey, this, this, the chip growth is really big in gaming. There's something happening over there. The AI business is, is small, but it's got a very high growth rate. A couple of breaks in that thing, and it could take off like crazy. And we got no game there. We got nothing. We got no dog in the hunt, you know, those sorts of phrases. We better get something in that business. We should get something started. And that's where your white space team comes in. Now get out there. Let's figure mm-hmm. out how to get into that game. Let's figure out how we're going to play that game. And then you can start saying, wow, if that thing's growing at 20, 25% per year, why wouldn't I divert resources from protecting a business that's flat or, or 5% growth into the thing growing at 40% per year? You know, yeah. you can't be afraid of growth. You got to be, that's got to be your ambition is growth. Earnings aren't your ambition. They're the result. And you'll get that result if your ambition on revenue growth keeps you focused on trends, focused on putting money into the things that are going to grow. Yeah. I always use the, uh, at least for tech, maybe not for all industries, but for tech in particular, I use the, uh, the 16 year old um, framework. What are the 16 year olds talking about? Right. What are they doing? So I have a 16 year old and an 18 year old. My 16 year old, actually, they both are heavily into games, heavily into uh, a lot of communication with their buddies while they're on their games. They're delving into AI. Right. They're playing all these these uh, quirky games that have an AI model to them. And they're, I mean, it, that's right there. I mean, they're not they build their little systems, but they're more interested in the graphics side. Their processor is sort of a basic, but their graphics cards 
are number one. And so I use that kind of as a litmus test of where are things happening in tech. Right, right. You know, it, 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 it's, it behooves all of us to get out of our box and then think, <laughs> you know, get yourself in a other place, you know, maybe a place you're not comfortable, you know, and, and then watch what's going on around you. Watch customers, watch behavior, watch how things are being done. Yep. And do that with your eyes, not to say, just let it absorb, you know, what am I seeing happen? Because that's the only way you're going to keep yourself current. If you constantly have your inside your box, running your business, you know, keeping things orderly in your life, the way they've always been, then you will eventually get blindsided. It will happen. Will. Always will happen because the world is an ever changing place. And eventually what you do will become something that nobody cares about. Just like the exactly. guy used to shoe horses, right? You need it yep. at once. You don't need it anymore. And that's what's going to happen in your business and in your career if you don't force yourself out of your box and then start thinking as you look around. And I think this is one of the biggest strengths that Spark Partners and, and other people like us out there in the industry invite us in to take a look at your strategy. Invite us in to look at what is happening in the market and then just shut the hell up. Let us talk. <laughs> the reason I say that is oftentimes we talk about these things happening and the business owner, no, 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 not my business. No, 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 I can't do that. But look, we have a perspective that's outside the, the, the intimate day-to-day -day business that you're running. And it's, it's may not be clear to you at the moment, but if you have that outside perspective and, uh, and sometimes boards of, of directors, because they're sewn in to the same, you know, they're interested in earnings a lot as well. They may not have your best uh, long-term vision at, at heart and that you got to really look at others outside that, that you can bring in and have them look at your business. Hey, am I doing, am I going in the right direction? And we'll tell you, well, yes, you are. You're no, no you're not. And if you're list, yeah. if you're willing to listen and willing to act, you, you have a fighting chance at, at uh, making it to the long term. The world's best athletes all have coaches. You know, a golfer will have a swing coach, a putting coach, four coaches as they're getting ready to step up to play golf at the U.S. Open. Uh, but how many business leaders think of having the need to have a coach, someone who can watch them play and give them advice? You know, there's Very a tendency true. for business leaders to think it's all got to be me. It's all about me making decisions. I'm, as one president famously said, I'm the decider in chief. Uh, stop back, step back. And start saying, maybe if you're going to be in this role, what you really need is somebody that can help coach you towards making open-minded decisions based on and using a lot more external data. Very well said, Adam. This has been a good podcast. For those interested in more information about how to contact Adam and I, um, Manny at SparkPartners.com, Adam at SparkPartners.com. And we're here to support you and to be that perspective that you may not want to hear, but that you definitely need to hear. Thanks, Thank Adam. you, Manny. Cheers. Cheers.